Minister, good morning and welcome to our conference and uh, welcome to the 10th Delhi edition and the 12th uh, global edition of Sci-Fi. Uh, we were going to be celebrating 10 years in New Delhi of this conference and we wanted our most special friend, Minister Alo Lama, to be with us. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a flu came between your journey and India. I hope you're keeping well. I hope you're feeling better. Thank you very much, my dear friend, Dr. Saran, and um, honestly, I would have loved to do everything possible to be with you there physically, but um, this gives me an excuse to come back many more times, hopefully in the near future. Uh, I'm feeling much better, thank you, and uh, I'm hoping to contribute positively to this incredible gathering. So, uh, Minister, Dubai, when we think of Dubai, we think of those um, high-end stores, duty-free shopping, the transit point for the world, connected, connecting communities. In recent years, you are determined to make it the hub of our digital future. And as the minister of AI, I think you're the only minister in the world for AI. As the minister for AI, can you tell our um, audience here, what does your day look like? Like, uh, do you have data for breakfast? Do you process uh, numbers for lunch? What does the minister of AI do? Can you tell us what does he do? Well, in an ideal world, I would do exactly what you said, but uh, I am only human at this point of time, so uh, my day looks uh, very similar to most other ministers. However, um, I'd like to first go to your um, beginning of the statement uh, when you said we know Dubai for certain things. And one thing that is a constant is that Dubai is constantly changing. So mm -hmm. people who knew Dubai 50 years ago do not even recognize the current Dubai. People who know Dubai 10 years ago do not know um, how Dubai has evolved to becoming a technology hub as well. Um, and the UAE has become to be a talent um, uh, incubator in a country where talent from around the world is moving to scale up and to achieve global success. Now, when it comes to what I do, uh, in, uh, throughout history, if we think about what has happened as human, uh, humans have evolved technologies, there were ministerial positions that were created for certain technological advancements. So, for example, when we used to use wood fire and coal for energy production, there was not a single minister of energy in any country at that point of time. With the advent of electricity and the importance of electricity for society and the economy, we've seen uh, posts that were created for ministers of energy. The same is true as well for ministers, for example, of telecommunications. When we used to use letters and pigeons to deliver these letters, there was a postmaster but there wasn't really uh, a person looking at this and governing it. We hear every single world leader talk about the importance of AI. We hear every single CEO of a private sector company say that AI is going to change the, the future and change the world. Why don't we have more ministers for artificial intelligence? My job is to balance between the regulating the bad and also enabling the good. My job is to ensure that AI's deployment in the country allows for more proactive government service delivery allows for better economic returns, and allows for a better future to be created for everyone living in the UAE. And uh, I'd like to give you two quick examples. The first is oil. Uh, if we can't control the price of a barrel of oil, we want to deploy AI, and we are deploying AI, to increase efficiencies to reduce the cost of each barrel of oil. And that allows us to be a lot more resilient for price changes. And that's why the UAE today is a country that is able to adapt to the Billions and billions that were spent on um, the growth of the cities and the growth of the country has far, uh, you know, outpaced the growth of our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But with using AI, we're able to manage traffic effectively to ensure that people do not get gridlocks like you see in other places, even though we have increased the traffic flows across the day. So I'll give you a, a very quick example. Dubai's population is 3.5 million as a city. During the day, the white population hits 5 million. It can go up to 5.5 million. And then the evening, it drops back down to 3.5 million. This increase of 2 million people coming into Dubai requires more infrastructure. But if you use AI, you're able to optimize the traffic lights, you're able to optimize the infrastructure and the planning that you have to ensure that you don't need to build more to, to actually get this capacity. Uh, Minister, uh when we think AI, the general impression and assessments are that it's a data guzzler. And AI is generally going to do well in ecosystems which have large data sets, which means large human populations. People 
are betting on China, some are betting on India, others are betting on the EU and, and the US. How does Dubai, a relatively small country, and that's an understatement, see itself competing in this uh, new business uh, mode where population matters? So how is Dubai going to be competitive uh, in, in a world where size matters, if I was to put it in a blunt way? Uh, five years ago, I would have agreed with you. Today, I don't think size matters. Uh, and I'll tell you why. The thing is, the way that this technology has evolved has actually made use of uh, far smaller data sets today for far bigger outcomes. So historically, to train these models, you need a lot of data. Today, with the advent of uh, pre-trained models, you actually have something that is trained, for example, on data from China or India or the US or somewhere else, but can be deployed for multiple other applications where you don't need a big data set, you need a proper ap application or use case. So uh, in essence, we've moved today to, to a new way of deploying AI. So pre-trained data sets is, is one thing. The second is think about the three Vs of uh, AI in terms of data that we need. We need volume of data, as you mentioned. You need variety of data, so less bias within the data sets. And we need velocity of data, so accessing this data quickly. If you have the biggest data set in the world, but you can't access it quickly, it's outdated and the, the outcome is going to be irrelevant, right? Uh, in the UAE, if we think about variety, we have 200 nationalities. So I think in that we are number one uh, globally. And I, I don't mean this in an arrogant way. It's just the fact that we are a country with a very diverse population. If we look at velocity, the cutting edge infrastructure that exists here, 5G enabled infrastructure, the infrastructure that has been put in the last two decades, means that the velocity is far faster than countries with legacy infrastructure. And then the third thing is, with volume, on certain fronts, our volume far exceeds anyone else in the world. So with Emirates Airlines, for example, we have 170 destinations that Emirates flies to. It is by far the biggest footprint of any global airline in the world. It has the biggest volume of data. Mm -hmm. The same is true for logistics, with DP World operating over 70 ports around the world. The same is true for Danata when it comes to uh, operating airports. And there are many giants that come from the UAE that today have a big global footprint that makes sure that we have volume. On certain fronts, yes, we will not be able to compete. So I think if you look at India, for example, it's a great example. Today, the core talent of artificial intelligence globally still comes from India. I think this is not going to change. I think there are people that come from Europe, there are people that come from China, but if you think of the predominant leaders, even in Silicon Valley, they're mostly either Indian origin or Indians uh, by citizenship. So uh, I think what needs to happen is closer integration, where the UAE is able to actually leverage its infrastructure, leverage its diversity, and also allow for the talent in India to come and create global models that really dominate rather than be acquired by American uh, companies or European companies. Because I think today the, the scale-up model that exists in India and that exists in the UAE is one where we can have global dominance. And historically, think about the Dutch, right? The Dutch controlled the world through commerce. They did not have the biggest army in the world. And this was, you know, the, in the 14th and 15th century. I think the, the way that you're able to dominate the world today is through commerce. And if a country like the UAE, and, and we've seen this through the uh, I2U2 as well as the CEPA agreements, a country like the UAE and a country like India believe that their vision and their future is one that it requires them to work closer together, the outcomes can be one where each one's able to hit far above its weight. Uh, Minister, you mentioned a closer partnership and coordination. You've been watching the India story, the digital story, uh, over the last few years, you've also been trying to create deeper institutional linkages from education institutions to, of course, uh, startups and others. What do you think are the early harvest areas for a technology partnership between, say, Dubai and Bangalore uh, in the days ahead? And certainly under the I2U2 rubric, uh, how can Israel, Dubai, India, US work together in this domain? That's a great question. I think the answer, simply put, why do people flock to Silicon Valley? We need to ask ourselves this question and then see what are the opportunities that will allow us to replicate that model. People flock to Silicon Valley for access to capital, access to talent, uh, which is also very important, and access to an environment that allows them from a regulatory perspective to deploy much faster than anywhere else. On these three fronts, I think access to capital, today there's a lot of capital moving into the UAE, whether it's high net worth individuals or funds, 
to uh, uh, you know try to approach this broader market, so the African market, the Middle Eastern market, the Indian market, uh, and try to understand you know what investment opportunities exist here. Just because historically the UAE has been a hub for a broader region, you know, it's a country that cannot um, come and declare that it has a local market that is big enough for that interest. So in terms of accessing capital, I think both the UAE and uh, certain places in India or India more generally can work together. Second, think about Israel. Israel has an incredible local workforce, Israeli workforce, that is able to create models that are cutting edge and, and you know, uh, technologies that are uh, forward thinking. The challenge that they had historically was they had to either sell out to an American company or list in the U.S., in NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. Today, I don't think this, this opportunity is the same as it was in the past. Today, they can actually come back as Indian talent, a headquarter or have an international office in, in the UAE, expand in this part of the world until they reach a certain footprint where they're actually quite big globally, and then go to the U.S. and actually compare themselves to the biggest American companies without feeling like they're at a disadvantage. And then finally, I think, um, so let's think about the IIT example. So IIT has declared that it's going to open a campus in the UAE. Why is that very forward-thinking from uh, the Honorable Prime Minister Modi and the President of the UAE as well, uh, Sheikh Khan Zayed? Because IIT today is by far the best technology university in the world. We've seen that just from a sheer outcome of how many leaders today in the technology industry are from IIT or IIT graduates. The, the graduates are predominantly Indian. How do we make it the go-to university in the world for every nationality? So the top African talent, the top European talent, the top... And you can do that in one of two ways. Either create a lot of incentives to make them come to India and compete with Indian talent, which I think today... You know, at the government university, they do not need to come to India to compete with Indian talent to get these spots. Or create a satellite university that becomes your soft power tool to make sure that the global leaders in every country, whether it's government or private sector, are graduates affiliated with this university. This is the American model. It happened with Stanford, it happened with MIT. And I think that today is an opportunity for us to do it together. Uh, Minister, I want to uh, come to a slightly controversial or rather uh, emerging area. Uh, Web 3.0. Now, it evokes uh, the image of bitcoins and cryptocurrencies, and you have regulators having a, uh, you know, a spasm that, no, 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 it's very bad. It's, you know, it's, it's going to ruin our economy, ruin our people, ruin our population. And, and by the way, there are experiences uh, that could be um, uh, supporting that impression of Web 3.0. But you and your colleagues in Dubai seem to be embracing this whole new world this brave new world, if I was to term it that. Uh, Web 3.0, Dubai, and why Dubai? And why Web 3.0? What is driving your relationship with this whole new segment? You have a thousand uh, cryptocurrency companies or uh, uh, enterprises that are engaged in that sector located out of Dubai today. Dubai seems to be the crypto hub. What is, uh, what is happening? What is going on? So, uh, I think, Samir, um, th there are a few reasons for our interest and our bullishness towards the sector wh where, wherein many people are shunning it uh, and considering it to be a taboo subject to consider. The first is, I think we need to think about talent. Uh, today, the, the UAE is play is a talent play. It's not just industry, it's, it's where we can find the highest concentration of talent. And in the crypto industry, you have a high concentration of finance and technology talent. Right, that today are going to create something meaningful, whether it's in the crypto space or in fintech or in the, the, the new models of being able to create the next internet, as people say. Second is, you know, we have a necessity. The necessity is we don't have scale locally. Today, physical boundaries confine us. So think about it. Even if we had the highest migration rate and birth rate in the world, our the size of our country can take up to what? 100 million people? That's like at a, at a maximum. We can never look at competing where the population sizes are a billion or 500 million, uh, like you know, the Chinas, the Indias, the, the, the Americas, the Nigerias of the world, right? Um, but with Web 3.0, you're able to actually create a unique playground where those physical boundaries are no longer there. You're able to compete where you actually have a population of 2 billion or a population of 1.5 billion. And we have a great example here. Facebook 
is a country with a population of 2 billion people. There are 2 billion people that use Facebook on a daily basis. They have affinity to Facebook. They can't live without their platforms. Now, yes, it's a private sector uh, enterprise today, but it is, in terms of revenue generating, like the GDP of a country, in terms of services that it delivers, like a government. So why can't we uh, work on the Web 3.0 space to become a country where we're able to break down our physical boundaries and have a global lead? Uh, Mr. Minister, on this particular point, you are also, uh, you were mentioning to me in a conversation one day that you have, you are investing in training the bureaucracy in that part of the world, uh, investing in upskilling them, sending them to global universities to engage with some of these subjects. The regulatory challenges still scare the world, and especially in countries such as India, where you have uh, vulnerable populations who, whose savings could be wiped away if uh, Bitcoin has a bad mood. Um, how do you give? How do you create partnerships that are able to assort some of these fear, fe uh, fears in many of these geographies? The regulatory risk or the the market risk. Uh, how do you talk to your counterparts in India and tell them that Dubai is a Web 3.0 hub? India should be partnering with us when India seems to be having a hesitant approach uh, a, a, and, and, and you know, well-placed hesitancy in, in embracing this technology. Uh, absolutely. I, I think uh, there is this, um, uh, sometimes people think that there is this cultural or, um, uh, let's say, uh, societal imperialism that if we can do it, then it's right and everyone else should do it. And I think that this approach doesn't actually work. You know, um, what works for the UAE, because of the unique factors that make the UAE what it is, that it is a medium-sized country with a, you know, relatively small local population with uh, a high GDP, does not work for a country like India, does not work even with certain countries in Europe, right? We don't have the legacy infrastructure. There's a lot that we don't have that these countries have. And I think it's fair for us to see that we need to work together to understand what works for everyone, while at the same time identifying the unique the changes or the, the unique differences that each and every single country and, and populace has, right? I think uh, when it comes to India's hesitancy on certain fields, uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, we have a very dynamic government that is centralized, right? Um, in India, you have very dynamic local governments that have a decentralization of thought across the country, which gives India some of the advantages that it has that no one else has. So what India was able to do with the UBI, for example, and the payment infrastructure that the government puts, no country in the world, not even the UAE today, was able to achieve, right? So, so in that, the current model in India actually works. What we think, and I say this to my Indian counterparts at all times, I think uh, we need to think about how do we leverage both of our advantages to create a playground that allows us to leapfrog much faster as, as one unit, uh, both countries as one unit. So, for example, if you want to do something, but you're not sure what the outcomes are, and the UAE can become your test ground, please come and test it in the UAE. <laughs> and if we do something that works in the UAE, but we don't have the scale, please let us scale it up in India. So it becomes a win-win situation where India benefits, the UAE benefits, and the future is good for all, all people. We have a program that we launched called uh, the Reg Lab. And the Reg Lab is a number of places in the country where they are controlled environments for us to deploy uh, a specific technology or a regulation for six months, see the impact while it's really being you know, uh, addressed and analyzed. And then within six months, it either becomes law or uh, we go back to the, to the drawing board and say, no, this needs to be changed. So that is something that I would love for India to actually benefit from and for us to work together on. Another part is we realize that the biggest problem, and this is a problem that is not unique to the UAE, it's a global problem, the biggest problem when it comes to government bureaucrats is ignorance. Mm -hmm. Not knowing what you are dealing with and not knowing how your decision is going to affect whether it's the technology and its development or the industries related to it or the society and you know, that deployment harming them in the future. So we believe that one of the things we need to do if we want to be a country that is forward-looking and forward-leaning is to constantly be in an ignorance-combating uh, mindset. And you mentioned that we send our bureaucrats abroad. So we have a program where we send our bureaucrats to the University of Oxford, to Kellogg College, 
to actually go and learn what AI is, what AI ethics are, or how do you read code, what are the positive and negative impacts of AI. Uh, Mr. And Minister, then, can, I, can I interrupt you here just for the audience? How many have you sent till now to Oxford? Uh, you gave me the number once when we were chatting. So three, 320 to date. These are all senior government uh, dignitaries. Uh, so, so they actually are decision makers within the government. And today, when we come and deploy AI, we don't have this excuse of saying we did not know. Hmm. Like no one can say, oh, I did not know the impact and I'm sorry. Right? You have to, because for them to graduate from this program, they actually have to present an AI use case to a, a senior you know, uh, board of uh, experts in the field from the University of Oxford and actually defend that deployment, that it is ethical, that it is sustainable, that it looks at future generations in a positive sense, and it makes sense from both a social and economic sense. So, uh, on the, you know, I really like the proposition that um, in, innovate and test in Dubai and scale up and disseminate in India. Uh, is that also a, a formula that works for startups and these small companies that the Dubai Future Labs has been working on, something that you are very passionate about? I visited you last month. You were showing me these uh, wonderful automated solutions that you are building for logistic companies. Do you think that is a startup bridge is a possibility for again, the I2U2 partnership, but more importantly for a, a, a UAE-India relationship? Absolutely. Um, I think um, today the proposition that exists is not just a G2G proposition. It's a B2G, it's a G2B, and it's a B2B proposition as well. Um, some of our, our you know, um, success stories in the UAE are Indian-born, UAE-scaled global success stories. Which, which ensures, by the way, that this is a continuation of our history. 4,000 years ago, if you looked at Saruq al-Hadid, which is one of our oldest uh, artifact sites in the UAE, it showed that the UAE was the trading hub between the Indian civilization and the heroic civilization right, in Egypt. This was 4,000 years ago. Even 200 years ago, the UAE was a country that worked with India. There are uh, ingrained roots between the UAE and India that we need to leverage. I do not think that the future means that we will change from our past. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually think we need to double down on our past mm -hmm. and work closer together to ensure that if a startup wants to deploy something and it is not sure that it can deploy it in India, let it come and deploy in the UAE. Let us see the outcomes together and then determine, okay, this makes sense. Uh, it makes sense to actually convince the, the, the responsible decision makers in India that we've seen success in the UAE and it makes sense for us to do it in India. Maybe as well, you might find out in that deployment that there are certain issues that you do not see that will be there in India, where you should speak to the regulator and say, look, this doesn't work for India, it might work somewhere else. And a good example of that, think about self-driving trucks in, in the US. One of the challenges that exists today is there are a lot of truck drivers in the US that are American, over a million truck drivers. Uh, there are two sides of the aisle. Some people say there are not enough people to fulfill these jobs, so we need to automate. And others say the moment you automate, we all lose our jobs, so why should we go to this job? Right? India has other problems that might arise because of automation. I do not think that everything the UAE will do, India will find useful. Because at the end of the day, our role as a government is to think about society first. Correct. The economy is an enabler of society. Don't think of the economy first and then the, the society, because then at points of time, you will take an economic decision that will create social burden. So, um, Mr. Minister, you heard the, you were hearing intently the opening remarks uh, by the chairperson of ORF who was speaking just before you. Um, there was a degree of uh, starkness in his speech, uh, pretty much the theme of the conference, the binaries that we live in. Uh, you know, the cancel culture, the geopolitical moment, uh, country is not acceptable, people uh, uh, deplatformed, voices censored. How does a country like yours, a city like yours, navigate these geopolitical headwinds? And by the way, uh, technology is perhaps the new battleground for all of this. So how do you uh, keep your head down and navigate, navigate these choppy seas? where you have these geopolitical tugs and giants battling it out in, uh, in old and new theaters. How do you manage that? Um, historically, the world was uh, a world where it was either unipolar or bipolar or tripolar, where you had to choose sides. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm very impressed by your um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, and I see some of his speeches. And 
uh, one of the things that I think is clear for both the UAE and for, for India today is we don't need to choose sides. At the end of the day, politics is determined by the best interest of certain parties. And the best interest today does not mean alienating someone for someone else. Uh, I think that model that, that existed historically is unfortunately no longer here. Today, countries need to think about their own best interests, but need to think about how their best interests do not harm others. Right? So, for example, me working with India does not mean that I can't work with the US. And does not mean that the three of us can't work together. And I think the I2U2 example is a great example. One thing we are doing as a country, and I think this has been um, uh, you know, uh, uh, informally, but uh, uh, absolutely decreed by our president, our current president, is we will be a country that fights for peace and a country that works with everyone. Uh, 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 a great example of that is the Abrahamic Accord. So when most countries were shunning Israel, we said for 80 years we've been doing the same thing. It does not make sense for us to continue 80 years to do the same thing and not get results. Let us work together and let us try to find a way where we can achieve you know, the outcome that everyone wants while at the same time developing together as nation. The same is true uh, as well when it comes to technology. I think historically all of the models that we brought in, cultural models, uh, technology models, societal models, were from the West. Um, today, the, the examples that we need to do are examples that are balanced. We should not be um, you know, sensitive about our culture. We should not be sensitive about our history. We should not be sensitive about you know, our needs as a, as a global population or as a local society. So uh, I'll give you an example. I think the influence of Bollywood today on people in the UAE is huge. People watch Bollywood. They have an affinity towards India. I don't think it should only be Hollywood. The same with technology companies. Today, some of the Indian unicorns are coming and dominating the UAE market and the regional market. I think, well done, we should do more of that. It should not be a one-size-fits-all. And the moment that you do not actually match or, or uh, agree with a certain mindset or agree with a certain direction, that you get affected or you get threatened. Because at the end of the day, you know, um, the, the local characteristics of countries are different. So, Mr. Minister, let me ask you the final question for this morning and, uh, again, uh, Thank you so much for joining us. But I thought it's important to touch on this. Uh, there are uh, questions around how do we make sure that emerging technologies and emerging business models don't leave certain communities behind. The largest community that was left behind in the previous three industrial revolutions were women. Now, how, are, how is your ministry particularly, but certainly the Dubai Future Labs and all, trying to promote, invest in, and catalyze uh, women leadership out of Dubai, and um, perhaps even uh, create the incentives frameworks for for um, mainstreaming this. Is that something that is part of your design for the future? Absolutely. I think uh, our um, uh, current situation is, is different to most countries. Uh, we actually have a greater representation of women in certain sectors, especially in government, um, as well as today, actually looking at the technical field and STEM, most of our top graduates are women. So the, the, the person leading our space program is a woman. Our uh, you know, probes in our space center uh, has a, a far higher number of women than the most other space programs in the world. But I'm seeing a lot more women going into technical fields because today I think there's a cultural fit between the technical field and the requirements of uh, certain women in the culture. So you can actually work in a technical job to code, to, to be a developer, to be an architect uh, in the digital space without having to leave your rural village and having to drive for two, three hours for a job. You can do it virtually. And that's making a lot more women actually come and take these jobs and they're exceptionally smart. Our job, we put three targets for ourselves. The first is we want to have the highest percentage of women uh, coders per capita in the world, uh, locals. So we're doing a lot of programs for that. Second is we are constantly trying to make sure that our programs have a good representation of male to female uh, ratios. So um, we have the AI camps, we have some of the AI programs that we do. Um, around 45% at least of the programs uh, are attended by women. Uh, so, so for, sorry, 45% of attendees are women uh, of the programs that we do. And uh, if you look at the AI program that we did with the University of Oxford, I think today it's at 50-50. It's either 49, 51, or 50, 50 uh, women to men. Again, that is unique to the UAE because of our population demographics, because of many things that has happened over the last couple of years. But we think you cannot clap with one hand. 
you cannot move a society forward without having women be alongside men and actually have leadership positions and have the skill sets necessary to become leaders in the digital space as well. So, Mr. Minister, before we conclude, you are also someone who has created uh, one of the world's most influential governance summits, the World Governance Summit, which, by the way, we at ORF are delighted to uh, partner with. This year, we have signed an agreement with you and hope we can bring a bit of India to your uh, very large conference. How important is technology and emerging technology going to be in the governance space and certainly in the governance summit next year? Uh, is it a coincidence that the Minister for AI is the head of the Governance Summit, or is it by design? So, so that's a great question. I've never had this question before. Uh, thank you for uh, keeping this um, conversation uh, really on edge. I think, Samir, um, let me tell you a secret why my position was, was created. In the World Government Summit, uh, Elon Musk, who spoke um, a few years back, talked about the importance of AI for governments, and he said, we need to think about regulating AI. And in a closed-door conversation with the Zionist Sheikh Mohammed, he actually mentioned the fact that we need to look at uh, AI more seriously, and we need to have senior representatives in government that solely look at that as a topic of interest that, that needs to be addressed. Now, the difference between what we do in the UAE and, and most of our other governments, some people actually attend conferences, they you know hear whatever has to be heard, and they leave. We actually take it seriously. We said, okay, how can we take this, what, what, uh, you know, the advice that he g gave us, and transform it into action? The same also happened um, in 2018. The uh, Director General of the World Health Organization mm -hmm. came and talked about the coming pandemic. This actually, the session is on YouTube, you can see it. And he said that governments are not ready that the pandemic that will be coming, because you know, this is historical in terms of trends, and if we do not uh, put the right framework today and the right guidelines and the roadmap, we are going to be affected economically and socially. We said to ourselves, we are not just going to hear that speech, we're going to do something about it. So with the World Health Organization, we did something called the Disease X Forum as part of the umbrella of the World Government Summit. And we brought the private sector, academia, governments, and the World Health Organization to put a roadmap for how do you deal with pandemics. And that's why the UAE did exceptionally well compared to other countries when dealing with the pandemic. The government summit today is a platform that enables the government. So I think uh, partnering with a esteemed organization like ORF just ensures that we are able to make sure that the benefits are benefits that we can take from you and distill to the world, and at the same time that the world's benefits can come to the ORF and hopefully affect India positively uh, in the future. We were honored by the Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi's uh, participation in 2018 as a uh, guest of honor. And I think uh, one thing that, that I will say here the summit today brings everything, whether it's technology, whether it's social trends and others, to the forefront for governments to be ready. If you can go back to school as a government leader for three days and learn what needs to be learned to help make the future better for your citizens, it's at the World Government Summit. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for joining us this morning. Since you have confirmed to me that you will be coming to India soon, I take that as a yes for joining us at Ricina Dialogue, March 2nd, 3rd, 4th. And of course, uh, please join me in thanking the Minister for his participation this morning. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. And uh, please confirm my attendance. Uh, it's on the record now. Thank you very much.